I'm washing my uh, I'm washing my Dell right now. Before I talk about, it. I'm going to talk about my XPS a little bit. So I figured washing I should... your XPS. Yeah, because you know it's, t- it's touch screen. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know what I mean. Like I've got I've got hey, one I'm of these. Oh. Uh, yeah. Well, you got to get the V8 off the screen first of all. So, I can't come out yeah. tonight. I'm washing my Dell. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. I'll be busy washing my Dell tonight. Um, <laughs> so, but it's because it's got the touch screen. I wanted to get my fingerprints off of it. Right. Yeah, this that's the thing about touch screens that I don't yeah. quite get because yeah. I'd be reticent about actually touching the screen for putting um, yeah. greasy fingerprints all over mm-hmm. it. I, I've sort of given in. I've given in. I really have. You know, and the thing is, is what I've been finding because this uh, this XPS thirteen is is it's so light. It is it is it is two pounds. I mean, they talk about the new MacBook Air being crazy light. The new MacBook with USB C. Well, this has got a little more weight on it for a way more computer. I mean, it's just ridiculous how light this thing is. I literally thought Dell shipped this to me without a battery in it when I got it. Oh, seriously, it's that light. Yeah. Usually, batteries are where all your weight is. So yeah. I uh, <clears throat> I usually end up sitting when I'm sitting on the couch. It's on my belly. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and that. I and I have my thumbs on the screen, and I actually have been finding that I really like navigating. It turns out, turns out I don't mind using touchscreen to navigate the web. I just also really like having a full desktop with like an i7 processor, um, and like 512 <laughs> gigabytes of storage. So uh, I, it's not that it's not that I don't, I, but I also like having I also like browsing the web sort of with a tablet. So from time to time, I'm just sort of on my and I. And you know what? Like, because I'm not a huge trackpad fan. Um, I'll talk more about the trackpad in the show, but I'm not a huge trackpad fan. So you like nipples, like me? Uh, maybe, maybe I, maybe I should try nipples more. You know, I, I every now and then I experiment with things like that, and I find I like it a lot. But, every day, eight hours a day, I'm a nipple man. <laughs> really? All day. And you never yeah, go. Oh, you, yeah. You're never going. <laughs> no. You're never like. You never no. bring your hand down and touch that pad. You never go. No, I'm more no, of a no, leg no, guy. Myself, my hand down. Just me. I leave my hands yeah. on the nipples all the time. Okay. Never go down. Yeah. So well, I, I deliberately buy old computers that just reason. have nipples. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I know, I know. You guys are very hardcore about it. So what I've been oh, finding yeah. is when I want to avoid the trackpad, I've just been using the touchscreen. And the trackpad's actually gotten pretty good. I'll talk about it more. But uh, mm. I, I, I didn't expect to actually find myself. I thought I don't know. I, I, I've been using. I don't use touch a lot here in the studio. I use it sometimes. Actually, I use it just about every day. And I thought that I don't know. The more I have touch, the more I end up finding myself actually. When I was doing a lot of couch surfing with a touchscreen Chromebook, I really got used to it, and it was actually more comfortable than reaching down for the trackpad to, yeah. to reach up from the keyboard, and yeah. it, it made my hand, my wrist, feel a little bit better. Yeah, interesting. So I found that I found I found that to be interesting in the fact that uh, it's one more thing that keeps me in Chrome because the touch support is a little bit better. <laughs> Welcome to Linux Unplugged, your weekly Linux talk show that's prepared for the first laptop of my son, Dylan. That's right. Happy birthday, Dylan. My name is Chris. <laughs> and my name is Matt. It's all staged, Matt. I've got a, I'll tell you more about it here in just a second. I've got a laptop ready for him to go with the Minecraft launcher in his dock, all queued up. He's going to open up the laptop lid, Minecraft be right there on the screen, ready to go. It'll be his first experience to Linux. It's going to wow. be a glorious, yeah, it'll be glorious. It'll be glorious. And, uh... It was kind of cool, it, you know. I was I was trying to figure out if maybe I could uh, grab like a System seventy six laptop and right. load it up for him, or if I had like a machine here at the studio I could convert. <laughs> but with Linux Fest coming up, like all of our that's where all of our finances are sort of invested right now. Is getting ready for Linux Fest. There's no way I could afford a new laptop. And uh, Noah from the Linux Action Show said, "Well, why don't you hang on to the?" Well, I actually asked him first. He said, "Yes, it's fine. Why don't you hang on to that Sputnik XPS laptop that he'd sent up for last year's Linux Fest that I'd been hanging on to that I oh, replaced yeah. with my XPS 13 recently, and was you know when he came back up was going to have him take that laptop back. He said, "No, hold on to it." So I reloaded that Sputnik laptop with Elementary OS, and I got Minecraft ready to go, loaded up for him. And we'll be giving that to him tonight. It'll be his first Linux computer, which oh, is crazy. What is crazy about that is not only is this Dylan's first computer and it runs Linux, but then this weekend we're switching my wife Angela to Linux as well. So it's a big Linux week in the Fisher household. Wow. And that one on it, I've been working on Angela for nine years to get her to switch. And she's, she was like, I think she was more committed to iPhoto than she was to me. Oh, and see, for my wife, it's Photoshop. She's like, but can I, but can I do this one thing? Can I do that one thing? Because it have that one support. And it's like, yeah. it's all about the photos. Yeah. Yeah. Really yeah. For Angie, it's all about the photo management. Totally yeah. understandable too, right? We have three kids. You know, we've, we have our wedding in there. We have our right. construction of our house in there. The construction of the studio is in there. Like oh, she boy. has a lot of really important events that we have in her iPhoto library. And it's about 500 gigs worth. And so it, there's not a lot of programs that handle that super well. And she's got all the metadata and all the tags and all this oh, stuff. Yeah. But Apple has been 
discon- has discontinued iPhoto, so we're using it as an opportunity to move her to Linux. So it's a really exciting week for me. We have a lot going on. Plus, we have uh, folks from the JB team fly- beginning to fly in this week. So that's really cool. So there's a ton of stuff <laughs> going on, Matt. But nonetheless, we are gathered here today with a pretty big Linux unplug. So uh, why don't we bring in our mumble room? Time appropriate greetings, mumble room. Yo. Hey. Hello. Hey. Hello. Hello. Hey. Hey. Yo, guys. Hey, uh, there's, you know, I've been I've been picking up some of the gaps of stuff that has developed between when Linux Action Show aired and when Unplugged airs, which is unbelievable. There's like actual stories that develop and what is feels like eight hours amount of time. I know it's more than that, but to me, it feels like it's eight hours. Uh, and this was a big one. Linux 4.0 has been sort of released, I guess. Meh. Linus Torvald's whole approach on this whole thing, this is so funny. This would never fly with a commercial operating system. It would have to be a big release. It would have to be so much buzz and bang. And, and 4.0 comes out, it's like, eh, it's kind of a release. So Linus starts. So I decided to release 4.0 as per the normal schedule. Yeah, as there really weren't any known issues. And while I'll be traveling during the end of the upcoming week due to a college visit, I'm hoping that won't affect the merge window very much. But we'll see. Linux 4.0 was pretty, a small, pretty much a small release in both Linux Next and in the final size. Although small is all relative, I suppose. Uh, then he goes on to give some stats. He said, that said, there's a few interesting things about it. And he goes on to talk about a couple of them. Feature-wise, though, he says, and I love this one, 4.0 doesn't have all that much special. Much, of the ma- much has been made of the new kernel patch and infrastructure, but realistically, that not only wasn't the reason for the version number change, we've had much bigger changes in other versions. This is very much a solid code progress release. So go out and enjoy it. Linux 4.0, everybody. Woo! Woo! <laughs> I love it. Linus, oh, we're all sheep Torvalds, it's signed. All yeah. that hype minus the turtleneck. You know, it's uh, definitely pretty well done. Very, yeah. very low-key. Very low-key. Very, uh, and now, yeah, of course, now I'm like, well, I wonder where I'm going to get it. When do I get When am I going to get it? Uh, yeah, I, I like I like that he's like that that big patching thing. Yeah, that's that's not even a big deal. And and everybody was kind of like, oh, you know, they ought to take that patching feature and spin it as the new version. Like I've actually heard people say that they, oh, we yeah. should spin that for for four point we should spin the kernel live patching thing. Is and there have been some articles that actually ran over the weekend that did do just that. New Linux. In fact, in fact, I saw an article with the headline, uh, "New Linux Kernel 4.0 is the beginning of Skynet." I should oh, go God. see if I can find that. Uh, kernel, I'm gonna go see if I can find it right now. Kernel 4.0 Skynet. I, that was the, that should that should probably bring it up, right? Yeah, here we go. Uh, PC should, World. Yeah, here we go. Should, PC course, World. Yeah. yeah, Skynet closer to existence thanks to Linux kernel 4.0, and it has a big uh, ominous uh, tux with glowing blue eyes right there. <laughs> so some of the press is having a pretty good time with the oh, 4.0 release. However, Linus himself not so excited about it. Just seems to be pretty meh. Well, I li- you know what I like about him is he has his priorities straight. It's like, you know, really in the grand scheme of things, this is really a big thing for him. It's like, it's just another day at the office. He enjoys what he does. Yeah. He provides value to people. Now he's moving on with yeah. his life. He's good. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, it is pretty cool. Uh, shout out to our friends at, uh, hmm, let's see, Antegro, Antegro, Cinear, uh, Antegro, Antegros. Yeah, Antegros. We'll go with that. Uh, they just released a new <laughs> ISO, and I've heard from a few folks in the community who've tried it out. Uh, as you might expect, it's based on Arch, so it's got all the latest stuff, including GNOME 3.16. If you want a really pretty straightforward way to get a semi-close nati- uh, vanilla Arch install loaded, yeah, it's a pretty good distro to go with. I uh, I've, I installed it on my recent rig that I had to reload, and uh, it's been working great. <coughs> and uh, yeah, I've th- also tried it on that XPS for a little bit. Yeah, go ahead. I think that you know, for anyone that's looking to try Arch out first, I think it's it's a great way to get up and run up and running quickly. If you're if you're basically all about the Pac Man and not so much about the configuration, it's a it's really a smart way to go. All I think. about that Pac Man. Yeah. All about Pac Man. Hey, and then something else that didn't necessarily develop between now and last, but uh, we have Wimpy here to talk about it with us. Uh-huh. Is this really great deal between? At least I assume it's a great deal. We'll ask Wimpy between the Ubuntu Mate project. And I think it's, is it Entroware, uh, Wimpy? The hardware manufacturer? That's right. That's correct, yeah. So uh, this looks like a, this, if I'm understanding, looks like a deal where essentially when I go to order an Entroware machine, uh, it's not like, at first, I thought it was like one machine that's has going to have Ubuntu Mate on it, but it's all of their machines will have it as an option. Is that correct? Yeah, all the, all the laptops and desktop machines uh, will have uh, Ubuntu Mate 1504 as an option uh, when final release drops. When so when when so this this will go live when 1504 is live. That's right. Yeah. Are and, you super uh, excited or what? I mean, this seems like a big deal to me. Yeah, I am. Um, when 
when I got to sort of the end of 1410, I thought it'd be really cool if you could find somebody to put, you know, Ubuntu Mate on computers because my family have got a lot of old computers and they need replacing and it's like, you know, what would you get? And now, you know, Entro, we're based in the UK and you might have been mm -hmm. able to tell from my accent, I'm in the UK, oh. so that's, uh, that's handy. Oh. Yeah, I know. Mm. So, um, so yeah, this is a, a local computer manufacturer supporting Linux, putting an operating system that I've had a hand in uh, developing. Jeez, yeah, so yeah, cool. when my when my family are up for new computers, I know where I'll be going wow, to, to yeah. get their new computers. So wait, this whole deal is just so that your mum can get a new computer, <laughs> is that right? <laughs> and my wife, and my dad, and my father-in-law, and hey, my brother-in-law. Hey, sometimes that's what it takes. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. All about the family, huh? Yeah. Uh, Actually, it's noting, that was the origins is... of the project, so, you know, it just stands to reason. That, that is know, really neat, for the family. That is really neat. I didn't so, know I think that. this is probably the first uh, Ubuntu flavor where there's been hardware available on the very first release that it's become an official flavor. Surely. Interesting. Very cool. Yeah, I see they have a Steam machine, So too. I, I, I I didn't realize that Mate wasn't yet actually an official flavor yet. They knew the current releases weren't official. Uh, it will be by next Thursday. Oh, okay. Yeah, so 1504 is the first official, official version, yeah. Now, uh, this now uh, this is not available in the U.S. or will be available in the U.S.? They're not shipping to the U.S. at the moment. So at the moment, this is only available in the U.K. And I've spoken to the guys from Entroware, and they're currently putting things in place to offer their products throughout Europe with the appropriate um, European keyboard options. Cool. So I don't think you're going to have Entroware shipping in the U.S., anytime soon but if you're in europe uh you certainly will do and keep an eye on intro where's twitter and google plus feeds to find out more about that because that there'll great. be there'll be updates soon but you know you're spoiled for choice in the us you know you've got yeah. plenty of options yeah. over yeah. there with system no, 76 I, I, and this is, that's more than fair think it's, penguin yep yeah it's more than fair and uh Completely. and this is great i mean this is this is great to have another vendor to recommend to the audience and um i i i just it, 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 to, to give somebody a machine preloaded with Ubuntu Mate is going to be so nice. It, it, it's such a great option for people that want to come from Windows. They're not comfortable with a totally different environment. They really like that paradigm that you know Mate lets them have. Uh, I, I think this is a great. I think this is going to be a lot more common. And surprisingly, <laughs> Popey, <laughs> we didn't see that from Elementary OS after their countdown ended, did we? <laughs> yeah. Nope. Yeah, I got that completely wrong, didn't I? Well, I was all in with you. I thought it was great. Uh, uh, Cassidy tagged us and said, "Well, uh, nice try, guys. It was good. It was fun to listen." <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's fine. You know what? It was. It was actually a pretty good announcement on their part. Tip of the hat for them putting out a good message. I thought they did a pretty good job. Um, well, uh, congratulations, uh, Wimpy, on the, and you guys can find out more at entroware.com, E-N-T-R-O-Ware.com, and expect yep. to see it with Ubuntu Mate when 1504 Next. ships. Yeah, uh, a couple of weeks uh, that should be available, and keep an eye on them, because they've got they've got a couple of really interesting announcements. I wish I could tell you what one of them is, because it's so up your alley, Chris, it's untrue, but they've got a real interesting thing in the pipeline that... Um, mm. Uh, is is uh, yeah that will be the next uh -oh. thing I buy I think I have a feeling I'm going to be begging you to uh, to to uh, send me one I'll be like I'll oh, send you a check <laughs> just send me one <laughs> <laughs> all right well cool keep us posted when that happens do they have a newsletter where people that can want to like get the latest updates on what's going on think they can subscribe they to do. Yeah, awesome. they do. Okay. Uh, on, Check so out. they've got the various social media outlets, and they do have a traditional newsletter via email, which is low volume, and they'll give you all the details there. Oh, fantastic. Okay, cool. There you go. Entryware. Hmm. Cool. All right, guys. Well, um, so I'm running uh, right here on this machine that I'm doing the visuals on. Uh, this is my Bonobo. I've got uh, GNOME 3.16 on this. I've got a machine upstairs that is my uh, reloaded uh, Antigros box that's running GNOME 3.16. And... Uh, <clears throat> Here in studio with me today, I've also brought in my new XPS 13, which is also running GNOME 3.16. These are all machines that I use heavily every single day. These are my three main machines. Um, that's where I spend um, universally 100% of my computer time, is uh, unless I'm editing video, which is very, very rare these days, uh, is on GNOME 3.16. And <clears throat> I've talked a lot about GNOME 3.16 on the show. I've just said it 100 times, and I haven't <laughs> talked about some of the problems it's had. And we got in a note on the subreddit uh, from Speed Ghost about some of the issues he's ran into with GNOME 3.16, and the list is a bit extensive. 
So since that's going to take a couple of minutes to break down, and it's a, it seems like a pretty decent uh, topic change, I'll take a minute here, and I'm going to tell you a little about something that makes me feel like a wild man, like I'm on the frontier of a new technology, and that's my friends at Ting. Go to linux.ting.com. Linux.ting.com. Not only does that support the show and keeps us going, which is, you know, a great idea, but it actually gets you a $25 discount off your first Ting device. And if you have a Ting-compatible device, which you probably do because they now support a wide range of GSM devices, they'll give you a $25 service credit. Or if you get something like, you know, one of those MiFi devices, then you get $25 of data credit, which will last you quite a while. Ting is mobile that makes sense. No contract. You only pay for what you use. It's a flat $6 for the line. That is Ting right there in a nutshell. They have a wide GSM network and CDMA network right here in the US of A, a brilliant dashboard to allow you to manage multiple devices. I pay $6. I got three phones. Three phones. I pay $6. I feel like I'm some sort of crazy Leo Laporte baller with all these phones, and I'm only <laughs> paying $6 for a line. It's genius. And if you really are savvy, you can save so much money. You really can. Like, uh, my average bill for these three phones is below $40. And then, like, this month is probably this month and maybe a little into next month are my busy times with Linux Fest Northwest where I'm making phone calls and I'm downloading stuff on the road. I'm driving with maps going and all this kind of stuff. That is like my high period. Maybe I'm going to hit 60 bucks. Maybe. I don't know. And actually, it's kind of cool because the Ting dashboard is really smart. It'll say, hey, based on your previous usage and your current usage, this is your trends. You can set alerts. You can turn devices on and off. So if you don't need to use them for a little while, you don't got to pay. That's great for like those MiFi devices. And they have no hold customer service at one 855 ting dubs Go check them out. Try out their savings calculator. You know, what I really find nice about Ting, too, is... The fact that they, they do have that customer service, and as the GSM rollout uh, is going, they're a little busy. So I've, I've never, in, in more than two years that I've been using Ting, needed to call. Which seems like such a shame. <laughs> but uh, the reality is their dashboard is so great, their help system is so well done, and they have established communities on Reddit. There's a uh, Ting subreddit. Um, on YouTube, on Twitter, they have uh, very active forums where there's people getting Firefox OS and Ubuntu Touch running on the Ting network. Like, I've never needed to call in. It's really nice. So go to linux.ting.com, get that discount. That way you can start saving early. And if you have a contract right now, Ting has an early termination relief program where they'll pay up to about, I think, 25% of your termination fee. That's pretty nice. And then now then you don't have to worry about it. You get to own your device from Ting. I've got the Nexus 5 on the Ting network. They have a great range of devices. I think the Nexus 5 is really sweet. I know it's getting harder and harder to find it now, unfortunately. But it's just such, it's such a great phone. Um, and it works perfectly on the Ting network on CDMA or GSM. I've ran it on both. It's $9 to get a GSM card. So if you got something you could put GSM in, it's $9. And then you just pay for what you use. Get the Motorola G. This is a great Android phone. $91. No contract. Unlocked. You own it. $91. And then you're on Ting, right? And you're getting that $25 discount, which is crazy. The uh, Novatel MiFi 5580, $121. Then it's a $6 hotspot after that. $100, $121, you own that, and then it's a $6 hotspot. All right, you get the point. This is just great. Kyocera Vibe, $159. They got the iPhone. Go check it out. Linux.ting.com. This is a way better way to do mobile. You have better things for your money. I've saved over $2,000. Oh, they're selling the Nexus 6 directly now. Oh, are you serious? <laughs> oh, no, Chris. You know, Chris has been wanting a new phone for Linux Fest. Oh, <laughs> no. Linux.ting.com. Go get yourself something nice. And then, you know, if you're like me, you'll save about $2,000 in about two years. And then when you're buying a laptop from that money, you're like, oh, yeah, why did I, why did I support that duopoly? Linux.ting.com. Thanks, Ting, for sponsoring Linux Unplugged. Good stuff. I wonder if anybody in the mumble room has had any problems with GNOME 3.16. Anybody in here had any issues? Other than like some of the obvious, like you know, maybe an extension doesn't work. Nope, just an extension. Yeah, it's okay. So it's been really yeah. smooth for me on the three primary machines that I use. It really smooth, like the smoothest GNOME upgrade I've ever done. I do have one minor complaint, but it's extension related, and it's you know it'll it'll get worked out over time. But it, unfortunately, it's really annoying. But. <clears throat> Speed Ghost says, I have to say I'm surprised at all the GNOME 3.16 love when I've had nothing but problems. I love GNOME 3.14, and I waited until all my extensions were up to date before I upgraded my Arch laptop. When I did, here's what I found. My home.config folder was empty, and all previous settings for GNOME and a few other apps were gone. Each time uh. I close my laptop to hibernate or sleep, it crashes, it opens all programs, and starts the sessions new when it resumes as if I had just restarted the whole computer. 
The temp directory, which is four gigabytes for some reason, is now usually half full on every startup. I admit, I'm on the bleeding edge with Arch, which is what my backups are for, as well as the stable dev machine that runs Fedora. Oh, hold on a second. That's rich. Okay. Stay, did I hear you correctly? And he said, okay, okay. that's cool. Yeah, that's good. That's right. good. That's good. That's good. Uh, no, I'll, I like I'll that. Allow that. I like that. Yeah. I like the idea that something lasts for nine months is stable <laughs> or whatever it is. That's good. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. So my dev machine, uh, that, whatever, it's fine. No, Fedora's great. It's Fedora's super stable. Uh, so my dev, I love Fedora. I really do. Fedora, uh, my Fedora machine, my stable dev machine that runs Fedora. Okay, I'm just getting caught up on that. I'm sorry. My mm. stable dev machine that runs Fedora where I get most of my real work done. Okay, I just had to get past that. Uh, I didn't have any of these issues with GNOME 3.14. This release a step back for me. Things can look pretty all they want, and they do look pretty, but they break my workflow for prettiness, then I'm unhappy. I love GNOME 3.14, but I've had nothing problem but problems with GNOME 3.16. Boom. Hmm. I'm still getting over the Fedora thing. Um boy. <laughs> you know, it's I, I, it's interesting because you know, obviously, I've moved on to Matei. You know, as far as my desktop oh, experience, oh man, but, but this is what's getting me, Matt. This is what's getting me worked up. This is this is getting into the ButterFS thing, and I don't want to jump the gun too much. But what I really hate, and I'm telling you, I'm starting, I'm dancing right now. I'm so upset uh -huh. about this. Is right, I, right. I, I just, I really, I really, 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 really hate it when we just default to well, it's Arch. That's the problem. You know, if you well, weren't rolling, now here's the thing. I yeah. think what that is, is I think that is a bias that makes us jump to that conclusion. Is it possible that it's because it's Arch? Absolutely always possible because you're rolling software. Absolutely every single time that is ab certainly possible. Uh, but I believe it is irresponsible and a disservice to jump to the conclusion that it is Arch. Because here's why I, I think we need to get past the bias that software is scary. That developers develop software that is scary and that all upgrades are bad because really that is not true yes upgrades it always and inevitably eventually invite some regression but on the whole upgrades on open source are generally improvements stability improvements feature improvements improvements and and most of the time it doesn't break I, and this is from somebody who's who does have arch machines that are multiple years old now right two well wait right. two mo two years old i don't know very old I mean, I just, I hate jumping to Arch. And the reason why this is, I'm a little, uh, a little sensitive to it is not only did this post do it, but I got like a bunch of emails that do it. We have several threads that did it about the ButterFS stuff last week. And it's just mm. the immediate jump reaction to let's blame Arch. Well, okay, that's fine, I, I suppose. <laughs> but it, it seems lazy. It, it, seems, it seems intellectually dishonest to just always assume that's the cause. Well, so I think we take a step back and look at it from a practical point. I've had this problem upgrading release to release. So it's not that it's Arch at all. Yeah, it's right, just yeah. anytime software you change software, <laughs> it, it is. I mean, yeah. you are choosing to in, enter an environment to where you're saying, okay, I clearly am tracking the packages that I have, and if I need to roll back, I will. If you're not able to do that, don't yeah. use it. So I mean, uh, that's I like know, that's uh, I like Zero Lock here, Matt. Zero Lock sounds yeah. like he's my kind of masochist. You you love the <laughs> update Zero Lock? You love them? I, uh, I wake up first thing in the morning, and I yeah, run right. uh, an after you disk upgrade. I'm on Debian SID, so I get yeah. my, my nice rolling updates as well. Right yeah. I yeah. used Arch for nine months and updates were my crack. Uh, they're great. I mean, and, and, and in the nine months that I was using Arch, I only ever had one problem, and it was because of a proprietary right. NVIDIA driver. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I also, uh, I, I get a little bit of an endorphin squirt when I see a big list of updates, and I also get a little like, oh, when it's only like three updates. I'm like, but then I'm like, well, at least I got three updates because I really never want to <laughs> really? run that and not see any updates. Yeah, I know. That's how bad I am. See, and I'm the opposite now. It's like I, I, you know, again, I'm big on taking responsibility for your desktop. If you broke it, you bought it, deal with it. It's your fault. But at the same time, it's like I don't necessarily want a lot of updates unless it's actually right. offering yeah. me a security fix that. or yeah. a feature. Yeah. You know, if now, it offers those two things, cool. Blaster, but, you, you know. agree with Matt. Like uh, if I decide to run Arch, then I'm taking my life into my own hands, right? Yeah, I feel like if, if you're going to be running Arch or really any bleeding uh, distro that offers a bleeding edge, yeah option then you're kind of taking your love into your own hands there when you run updates <laughs> you're, you're accepting the responsibility that something might break i mean I, I grant you that but i what i argue is the the level of risk that it actually genuinely is see my point is not that what you say is inaccurate i grant you it is wholly accurate what i would like to argue is how much of a risk it it truly represents and wimpy you've had a work, arch workstation for how long three years now my main workstation is installed three years ago 
And so what is your what is your thought? Is, is rolling inherently um, da- more dangerous and unstable, but just yet manageable? Mm. How is it? No, I don't think rolling is inherently more dangerous. I mean, you've got someone there, Zero, um, has got uh, a SID installation and he's rolling with that. Um, you know, software developers don't just throw out releases and hope it works. You know, they have been tested. So it's not right. because it's a new package, it's untested software. Right. It's already been tested. Right. All that's happened mm-hmm. is it's been packaged so you can install it conveniently. Right, and it just happens but, to get packaged faster right. in Arch. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's... Um, uh, sort of one of the or other the key, as well. yeah, yeah. Well, you know, if you, you look at you're just ragging, but you know, Fedora Rawhide, for example, they're they're pretty much on the same on the same curve mm-hmm. as Arch. But um, I would actually, I wouldn't compare Arch and Fedora in terms of uh, Rawhide in terms of stability, though, because Rawhide doesn't prom. I mean, there is some intention in Fedora for the for the system to be stable, right? Whereas with Rawhide, they will they will they sometimes have a work in progress that gets introduced into Rawhide. Yeah, yeah. But the, the the thing with Arch is that um, managing your updates in Arch Linux is not simply a case of running Pac-Man or Pac-AUR. Um, you're responsible for actually tracking what the new configuration changes were that right. were introduced mm-hmm. by packages and then merging those. And if you don't read the documentation that explains how to do that mm-hmm. and you ignore it, eventually bad things will happen right. but that's yeah. a contract that arch linux makes with you at the at the outset you know they explain that you have to be a competent linux user and you have to be prepared to learn how the system is put together and learn how to maintain it i agree and like ryan yeah. says ryan you you think that means arch right there if you accept that it means it's not for everybody right i agree yeah i i i don't think that arch is for everybody yeah, absolutely. Uh, just because you can run Arch and just because you can run the updates doesn't mean that, I mean, like Wimpy said, you have to be tracking, you know, what's changing and also be aware of what's already in your environment and if there's going to be any breakage. And that's why, you know, distributions that are out there that aren't rolling release are, are good for some people because the pe- right. that falls on someone else to test all these things and make sure that there's compatibility. Yeah. I would argue, though, that we put too much faith in that and we put too little faith in the rolling system. Like, like neither one are as good as we pretend or as bad as we pretend them to be. Yeah, yeah, no, I would well, agree, I agree with that. that, that uh, stuff breaks under Ubuntu all the time and, and oh, other yeah. distros as well. Sure. Um, nobody can, anybody who's been using Linux for longer than a year knows that that stuff happens and, and things break even when it is curated by a distro. But yeah. at the same time, uh, as we've talked about before, as you've talked about before, there's, there's a s- certain level of competency that you want someone to have before they start, you know, curating their own, you know, Arch Linux installation. And that's, you want them, that person to be, you know, able to look at the changes that are coming through, make sure that's going to work in their environment. Because I have used 3.16 and on a rolling release distro, and it worked just fine. Mm, so, yeah. I, you know, yes. I think that it, that person has to be ready to yeah. troubleshoot problems mm-hmm. that they have, like he he described. Now, I like Tech Dragon. Tech Dragon's like, no, no, roll all of the things. So, rolling for everything, Tech Dragon, all of the things. No, if it's not my desktop, it's rolling. Oh, so not all of the. <laughs> I trust nine nine terabytes of files to a rolling distro. Yeah, I would be completely devastated if that went out of the way. So you have pretty you you feel pretty confident, and I I actually I don't blame you really too much. It's a little risky for my file storage. I've, I'm pretty happy with FreeNAS right now, just because I like ZFS quite a bit. Um, oh, I'm on ZFS. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. But it's ZFS on Linux. Yeah. I'm rolling with current. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which distro? It's uh, on Ubuntu, but I'm actually running it on the current upstream un- unstable packages. <laughs> of course, why not? Daily updates. Of course. Of course you are. Because <laughs> why job. not? Every morning. You're brilliant. Yes, you're brilliant. Yes, of course. Uh, well, and another way to look at it, too, is that when you're working with an operating system, at the end of the day, if your user data is at some level safe, whether it be backed up or off-site, or you just feel comfortable in your uh, home directory setup, you know, it, fixing anything is just mm-hmm. a matter of time. Yeah. You know? and in so fact, it's really not the end of the world. Uh, when we get to the, uh, to the follow-up on my file system loss, uh, I will... Uh, 
uh, I will follow up on some some interesting ideas the community has for some really nice, efficient backups that are really like low key, not bit high impact kind of stuff. Sweet. So we'll cover those in a few minutes in the show. I just had a couple more follow up items uh, before we get to that because uh, I do want to because that 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 got a, that generated a lot of feedback last week. But uh, we have I have seen a steady trickle of interest in the Dell XPS 13 continue now that the developer edition is out. And uh, I wanted to give thanks to Slack Warrior in the uh, subreddit who mentioned that the BIOS update for the Dell XPS 13, which I have right here, uh, does fix quite a few problems I was having. So now the current version as of this recording is the A03 or A03 um, BIOS. And so for the Dell XPS 13, the, the one that came with Windows or the one that runs Linux, once you install that BIOS update, uh, one of the things that immediately starts working is sound. So that's really nice. The sound card just started working instantly. Also, issues I was having with the trackpad earlier are now pretty much all cleared up. The trackpad uh, seems to be one of the better trackpads I've used under Linux. Uh, two finger scrolling is working quite well. Um, uh, the uh, the uh, touch to click works really well. The laptop itself is now with these issues resolved. Uh, I still have some problems with the Display Port, but with these primary issues resolved, the laptop itself is becoming one of my favorite computers. Uh, it's now wow. it's my it's, I bring it with me all the time because it's super portable. It's it's I think it's about as light as the MacBook, uh, the new MacBook with only the USB C connector. Um, mm -hmm. But it's uh, yeah, it's a, a lot better of a machine. Um, so now this is because it's so light. I just toss it in my bag and I bring it with me all the time. And I've been finding myself uh, really enjoying it. And uh, I, there's just a few a few nagging issues with high DPI. I wouldn't buy the laptop based on the screen, but the screen is quite nice. And uh, with the new BIOS update, I would actually give the XPS 13 a pretty solid recommendation. Developer edition or the Windows edition. Um, I would go with the developer edition so that way you don't have to mess with the Wi-Fi. Uh, the webcam's working. The sound is working. Wi-Fi is working. Uh, it all seems to be working quite quick. And the other nice thing, oh, oh, also keyboard. I had some keyboard repeating issues that are now solved because of the BIOS update. And the other nice thing is you don't have to have Windows or DOS to update the BIOS. You download an oh. EXE file, a quote-unquote EXE file from Dell's website. Uh, it's 2.4 pounds. Thank you, Micro98. So it is, it's more heavy than the uh, MacBook, but it, it's so great. Um, you download this quote unquote exe file from the Dell website. You put it on like a USB flash drive, and then you boot. And on, on the boot menu options, there's an update BIOS option, and it reads the flash drive and it just flashes the BIOS right there, and no Windows or free DOS or nothing needed to update the Dell BIOS. So that's really nice. <coughs> Um, let's see. I, I guess I'll just give a quick uh, Linux Fest update, just since we've been doing those, <laughs> and uh, I'm going to do it till the till Linux Fest is here, which is almost uh, almost here. So don't worry. Uh, let's see. Uh, one thing that's kind of cool, uh, un not directly related to Linux Fest, but as the host arrive um, over the next week, beginning on Friday and then trickling in after that, I'm going to try to snag some of them for Tech Talk today, and maybe grab one or two of them to join us on Linux Unplugged next week if the timing works out. I don't know. It might just be Noah who's in town then. I think mm -hmm. Alan arrives on Wednesday. So I'll, I'll try to oh, maybe okay. get Alan on a tech talk today in the future. Maybe we'll try to get Noah here in studio on Unplugged to join us. So as, uh, as hosts are arriving, I'll try to grab some of them and, and bring them here. We've got all kinds of stuff planning. Everybody's going to uh, have some, uh, some time in studio to record something for their shows, which will be great. Um, we'll do Coda Radio in studio. We'll do BSD Now in studio, all of that stuff. Dude, some, we'll do two, we're going to shoot two tech snaps in studio. So a lot of great content coming up with uh, with everybody here in person, um, some for the first time ever, and then it'll be ending at Linux Fest Northwest. So it's going to be a pretty cool week lead up to Linux Fest Northwest as well, uh, April 25th and 26th, and we'll be live streaming that over jblive.tv Saturday and Sunday. We'll be recording the Linux Action Show there at Linux Fest, so you're welcome to join us Sunday. Uh, we'll have hopefully some seats for you to sit at. Uh, well, last year we just kind of made do with what we had, so hopefully we can yeah. do that again. Um, and and if you're going to be there, also I encourage you to join our meetup. We now have let's see, 130 it looks like. Yes, 130 participants over at meetup.com/slash/jupiterbroadcasting. The first event we have listed is a local Linux is the local Linux Fest. The next event you might see on there will be another local event that'll be Linux Unplugged 100. We're at episode 88 right now, and I think I want to do 100 on location. So uh, that'll be a local meetup event. And I'm also opening this up to the individual hosts. So uh, I've, uh, I've offered it to Alan and uh, Noah and uh, Michael Dominic as they travel to go to their different meetups and different fests and different events. And um, Mike's doing like a, a developer thing, and he, he's going to be traveling to New York. Uh, I've invited them to use the meetup page as well to meet up with you in different locations. And Alan goes all over the world. 
So uh, that could be a pretty cool tool. Meetup.com slash Jupiter Broadcasting. If we have an event in your area, it'd be a great, we'll, great spot. We'll be organizing it. You'll see a lot of local stuff because I want to do more. I want to do more out of the studio stuff. But from time to time, you'll definitely see stuff all over the world. Meetup.com slash Jupiter Broadcasting if you want to get in on that. And then uh, we might eventually turn that into kind of like a lug thing where uh, we take, if we get it, uh, what I would really like to do is if we got enough people joining us and we could take the, the really hardcore Linux user group and we could like do stuff for Unplugged. Record stuff from unplugged. Go, wouldn't it? Okay. Now here, okay. <laughs> Let's just get crazy. Like, what if we use this meetup group to, like, organize, like, a big, like, um, install fest or something? Like, we go to a lot, like, we, like, I would, I would pre work out, like, an arrangement, like, at a library, like, hey, can we come in and do all the maintenance on your computers? We'll blow them out. We'll clean them up. We'll, uh, you know, uh, fix the keyboards up. We'll, uh, uh, maybe we could even set aside a little budget to replace some of the components. And by the way, we'll install Linux. And then we just use that this, cool. and we record the whole thing, and, and we go total reality show style where we're like, we'll do like, we'll have a room for confessionals with the camera. Well, people will like, they'll like, they'll sit down in front of the camera and be like, yeah, I wasn't sure how that install was going to go when that drive started <laughs> clicking. It got really tense. We weren't sure how that was going to develop, even though it was like already totally pre-done and we just have them go back and like record those confessionals so we could cut to them. I'm, t- I'm t- it sounds like I'm joking. I would totally do this. If this meetup thing works out, we c- let's go use our powers for wow. good. Let's go install some Linux, some places and record, make show yeah. out of it. If we could, if we could, seriously, we could big brother this Linux installations. We could go deploy Linux, convert people to Linux, and make show content out of it. Meetup.com slash Jupiter Broadcasting. You think I'm kidding? Test me. Go sign up. Let's do some meetups and let's see if I do it because I'm serious. I'm serious. Could be cool. And even if you're not in the area, you can still sign up for when we are in your location. Yeah. All right. This is, whoa, somebody's trigger happy in the mumble room. Whoa there. You knock. You, hey, hey, hey. If I have to come in there, I will. Do not make me turn this show around. (laughs) (laughs) I'm glad you guys got the dad reference. Mumble room. Mumble room. I will turn this show around. Uh, Hey, Matt. uh, All right. We're going to talk about uh, my, my, my rig blowing up. Oh, boy. I do this sometimes, and I seem to do it the most on this show. And I think it's just sort of the fleet, free-flowing nature of the show, where I just get on, I just get going. And last week, you know, I was raw, Matt. It was rough because my my, my main rig, my my boo, my bay, <laughs> just such a stupid word, it died. <laughs> just get anyways. So I, I mean, what what really happened is there was, you know. A kernel update and a Butterfest thing. There's a hard lock. And uh, what I, I I applied the Noah philosopher. I was like, let's see. It'd take me about five, ten minutes to fix this. And I've got this USB thumb drive with the latest Antigross image on there. I've been thinking about reloading anyways. Pop, and I, you know, I reload. Because I have all my data right. backed up. It's not a big deal. Makes sense. It does suck some time up. And it always sucks up more time than I think. Like every time I go to reload a machine, I'm like, ah, what? This will take, ah, oh, take like five minutes. It's no big deal. It's wrong. <laughs> no, man. It always takes a whole day. It always does every damn time. And every time somebody tells you I can get it installed in 25 minutes, that's lying. Because even once you get the software installed, you got to change all the settings. You got to change the themes. You got to change the everything. You just shut up. It takes more than 25 minutes. So I, I guess a little raw. I came on the show. I talked about how I kind of regretted using ButterFS. I wish I hadn't used ButterFS. And I kind of got up on a soapbox and I kind of said what I think. Well, I still think this. I kind of think that ButterFS is an amateur show, and I kind of think that ButterFS weakens Linux, and I kind of think that ButterFS is a shame, and I kind of wish that ButterFS was in a lot better place, so that way Linux had a much serious and much more competitive answer to ZFS. And I didn't mean to say it was the end of the world for Linux, and I didn't mean to say the ButterFS was trash, but of course, of course, I kind of did. And of course, I even said I'd rather use NTFS, which... Was straight Ow, up trolling. Yeah, that, that, that was, was kind of a. I like, thought about wow, I man. should go clip myself because that really was straight up trolling, and that deserved even a, a, a clip. But I just, I'll admit to that. So I have some follow up. I have some thoughts on uh, file systems, and uh, we, hopefully uh, Heavens will join us here in a moment. And well, he is here. Hopefully he'll get into a good discussion with me on XFS. I got ridiculed to no end, no end for my choice of using XFS. People assumed that I was a bozo. That I didn't know what the hell I was doing. That I. I picked I picked some esoteric ancient file system and while spitting on ButterFS and condemning it for a future adoption by the open source community because my words are going out over the air. Seriously. So we're going to get into all of that and the lessons I learned from that. But first, I want to thank Linux Academy. Why? Because they're perfect for you. Baby, I know you. 
Linux Academy knows you. Why? Because they're Linux users. They're open source enthusiasts. They're developers and they're educators. And they came together and they created a truly unique thing, Linux Academy. And I get them. I get their passion. And I get coming together and making something better than anything anybody else has. I get that because they're enthusiastic about Linux and open source, that means they produce content about Linux and open source that's far beyond anything anybody else produces. And you can find out for yourself, too. Go to linuxacademy.com slash unplug. I could tell you what courses they have, but I don't need to. Because anything that's relevant, anything that makes you a better professional, anything in the Linux space that's important, they have courseware on it. They have 7 plus Linux distributions you can choose from. And I'm saying, at, if, if you want want to go learn how to use Docker on Red Hat Enterprise Server, go do it. You need to know how to use it on Ubuntu, go do that. They can do that. They'll spin up servers for you on demand when the courseware requires it. They'll give you public access. You get to SSH into that bad boy. And if you take advantage of some of their AWS courseware, which a few folks in our chat room have been. I've been hearing from a few folks recently. It seems like the AWS stuff just keeps growing and growing and growing. And so people need to learn it. It's very relevant. And so they, their courseware on this stuff is top notch. And the other thing, that I love. As somebody who had to jump into AWS when it was fairly new, I got bit big time. I had a $200 bill just because I left my rig, my AWS rig that I was using for training. It was 230 something, 280 something. I got a big bill because I just left it on. I left it on. Well, a, they include the AWS instances as part as your as part of your Linux Academy's training. You just go over to linuxacademy.com slash unplug, get our super awesome 33% discount. 33%! It's a powerful right. number, and you should go over there and get more powerful by making yourself more valuable. Seriously. It's very rewarding. And it, it's sort of mind-blowing when something you've known, like a technology that you've wanted to wrap your head around, but it has seemed so nebulous where to start. When you go to Linux Academy and they have it broken out for you, you will learn this part about this technology in this many minutes. For me, that is a game changer because that is a quantifiable boom. That, I get that. It's no longer nebulous. Boom. I What? Five and a half hours for Ruby? No problem. I get that. I can spend five and a half hours to learn Ruby. That seems worth it to me. And with their scenario-based labs, you'll actually get how to use these technologies in a production environment. And that's the final gap right there. They close it. LinuxAcademy.com slash unplugged. They got a huge announcement coming up in just a couple of days, April 16th, 9 p.m. Central. I've been telling you about this for a while because it's a big deal and I'm really excited. And these guys are super passionate about it too. So that's, that's going to be great. They're going to stream it live over at linuxacademy.com. Go sign up now, and you just get all of the new stuff, and you always will as part of your Linux Academy subscription. linuxacademy.com slash unplugged. Keep this show on the air, train yourself up, and go support one of our local Linux friends. linuxacademy.com slash unplugged. And a big thanks to Linux Academy for sponsoring the Unplugged program. You guys are crushing it. So uh, for those of you who didn't catch uh, last week's episode, super, super quick version is my number one rig died, my baby. Uh, it gave up the ghost, couldn't mount my main partition, couldn't boot, and there were several options I could have had, including, you know, use a live CD, uh, try the fallback kernel, have file system snapshots. I mean, there's like a lot of different <laughs> tracks I could have taken. I opted for the nuke and pave, and, I, and part of the reason was, is I was done with ButterFS. Is this directly caused by ButterFS? Mm, it wouldn't have happened if I wasn't using ButterFS. Ergo, for an end user... Yes, right? It doesn't really matter technically, was it a kernel bug working with ButterFS? Was it a problem with ButterFS? At the end of the day, if I wasn't using ButterFS, I wouldn't have had a problem, right? And for users, that's all that matters. So in my opinion, probably means it's time to stop using ButterFS on computers that are important to me. And what I found to be interesting is the number one piece of feedback I got wasn't that I was using ButterFS. It's, well, God damn it, Chris, you're using Arch, you idiot. You're using Arch. <laughs> well, that's your problem. Well, see, I kind of disagree. See, I kind of think that this is yet another example of how ButterFS just isn't really fully baked into Linux. But people came to ButterFS's defense. And we had a, we had a whopper of one sent in uh, to the subreddit. And I liked the title quite a bit. The title grabbed me. I wasn't so hot on the content of the post. Uh, but <laughs> Corky has a good point here and there, so I want to address it. Why I think ButterFS remains the future for those who want it. And this is, you know, and this is why I wanted to use ButterFS too. Uh, because I felt like Linux really, it needs a solid solution here. It needs a pretty advanced file system that can stay competitive. It needs something that also allows us to do things we just don't do today. Like, we have heard some discussions about actually using ButterFS to distribute software. Like, there's a lot of really cool possibilities when your file system is modern and awesome. Um, and I'm going to talk about how PCBSD leverages some of those in a minute. 
But back to ButterFS. These kinds of features are kind of fundamentally required. Like a lot of people came back and said, you don't need these things. That's not your choice to make. I think the market says we do need these things, and I want these things as well. And so uh, Corky writes here, Chris on the latest episode of Linux Unplugged took the time to vent his latest frustrations. The issue in question is a bug that causes Arch not to boot on kernel 3.19.1-3 and 18.9 and 3.14.35, so a decent range. And uh, quite a few others have experienced this on Arch and ButterFS uh, setups. My frustration is not that he blamed it on ButterFS. This was a standard bug you expect in some kernel version. My frustration is not that he had it, but that he did blame it on ButterFS. And this was a common thread. And again, I feel like this is a bit of a nuance here. He says, this was a standard bug you would expect in some kernel versions, and it's quite common for a kernel upgrade to cause a set of users to have unbootable set of systems. That is the nature of Linux development. And it is true, the nature of Arch. These Linux kernel versions will not be released on Ubuntu, OpenSUSE, or Fedora, and will never reach Red Hat Enterprise Linux and Debian. Linux LTS releases are chosen because every other kernel version seems to destroy a particular set of users' experiences. And I'm actually going to stop there. That's a pretty common argument, and it's really not true. Big, big gotchas, there's a pretty good chance they won't make it into some of those kernels. But kernel 3.13 is a shit show. And there is a pretty major distribution, that, a couple of them, that ship, that ship with kernel 3.13. So it is not necessarily true that vendors won't ship a bad kernel. Because they do. And then what ends up happening is you get anchored to that piece of crap for the length of that distro, or you go outside the box and end up replacing it, which a lot of people do. And that's not much better of a situation. And then you run up exactly in the same situation I ran into. So he goes on to say, Arch Linux is an insane distribution because it lacks sanity checks. Other distributions are sane because they have a team of people who are fixing these breakages in stable packages, not development experimental technologies. I, get, I kind of disagree there as well. Some do, some don't. It's kind of a wide range, right? Well, and I think part of the problem, too, is a lot of times when people see breakage, 99.9% .9 of the time, it's because you went outside of the box. And if you're an Ubuntu person, that'd be a PPA. And if you are an Arch person, that's because you actually went with the uh, Arch user repository. That is not official Arch. That is, you decided to try something creative. And that's cool, but you're kind of on your own there. So yeah. a lot of times, I think that pe when people experience breakage on Arch, that's usually where it happens. Here's, and, and that's user error. Here's so. what I'm kind of coming to, though. Because I think fundamentally, Corky and others do have a bit of a point. And that point mm -hmm. is, maybe it is true that if you are going to use a rolling release, you have to kind of settle on a subset of technologies to utilize that are like sort of tried and true technologies um, that maybe don't have as much fluctuation. Um, and this is something I've been, this is something I haven't fully, fully formed yet, but it seems to me like uh, something I've kind of been. I kind of have been falling into, like, for example, when it comes to servers, and if I want, so if I want something to be server, but I want it to be a rolling distro, I'll sort of keep it really lean. Like, it only do a couple of things, and then I just spin up another VM, and then it only does a couple of things, and then I spin up another VM. That way I don't have a bunch of, bunch of packages on a rolling server. Right. And that's one way I sort of mitigate the risk on servers, and I can individually snapshot those before I upgrade those. And this is great for on DigitalOcean. This is, that's, this is how I do it now. Um, and and the same and, and and the same is not really necessarily true uh, uh, for for your desktop. But I, I essentially have found that if I kind of do more common file systems, if I do more common things like uh, maybe instead of using KDE on a rolling release, I go with GNOME or I go with XFCE or Mate. Uh, and maybe if you know, these kinds of like maybe if instead of using ButterFS, I use Extended Four or XFS, then I sort of reduce my amount of risk. And so if I, I find myself sort of narrowing my choices in what I will fully take advantage of if there might be some additional risk. But at the same time, the choices I find myself landing on are pretty solid. So I want to take a moment here and, 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 and bring Heaven's Revenge in because he's my XFS buddy. And I really wanted him here last week when I was talking about XFS because, Heaven, you were the one that really sold me on XFS originally. And so I, could you... Do you want to just take a moment and sort of break down in your mind ButterFS versus XFS and why maybe one might be a better choice for over the other? If you have that. Sure. But it will also... Oh, yeah. I generally do. But the point that you brought up a little bit earlier about Arch and being a rolling distribution and having the whole problem be Arch and having it just the nature of being rolling, that is approaching this problem from the wrong perspective because ButterFS 
is an experimental file system. It's blaming Arch for a problem that ButterFS has specifically tried to over-advertise itself. It says it's a stable file system. They tried to market like that, I think, a year ago. Stable or stability of a file system is simple. No on-disk or no incompatible on-disk format changes. If a file system is on, like, if it's stable or the on-disk format is stable, that is a stable file system. Otherwise, it is not. The ButterFS developers have claimed it to be stable while it is not. It is still in flux. So your problem is from ButterFS, not by hmm. virtue of hmm. it being a rolling distribution. Yeah, that is an interesting point. In fact, what they say is, yeah, we may very well have format changes, but we'll try to make sure that uh, newer kernels can still mount the old stuff. Yeah, they try, but there's always corner cases that kick everybody in the ass all yeah. the time. The most I noticed even open SUSEs <laughs> they try to say that it's stable and let's say for the most cases, for the most common and no or not complex situations, if it's just pretty much putting files on the disk, you should be okay. If you're trying to do anything relatively new with the distribution or with the capabilities of ButterFS, you will run into something. So, would you uh, have anything there, or shall I go into no. the XFS and ButterFS? Yeah, yeah, continue on because I, I think that's a that's a uh, that's a that's a good uh, a good point. Uh, well, actually, I'll let the person finish up vacuuming behind you, and I'll let Corky respond to his uh, his uh, subreddit post, and then we'll transition into the discussion of XFS and ButterFS. And I hope this isn't too dry. But the reason why I want to really hash this stuff out with you guys is because I get this question a lot: like, which file system should I use? And then when I say which file system I'm using, I find out that a lot of people out there go and deploy. That. And I didn't know, like, sometimes when I announced what I'm using, I didn't really realize that then people will also use that same one. So I just really kind of want to make sure we discuss this um, and and really talk about the advantages, disadvantages, because I think it's pretty important. And and, and it, I do admit that sometimes my sysadmin bias sort of gets in the way. But Corky, uh, do you want to touch on anything I mentioned from your, your uh, subreddit post? Yeah, my subreddit post was, well, um, in development. It's not a professional view because I'm not a developer, but I'm. I'd agree with some of Heaven's Revenge's points. Um, I have to say, ButterFS definitely has been getting better. As someone who's been subscribed to mailing lists, who's been following their gotchas wiki, one of the great things about wikis is you can look through the history. And if you look through the history, it's gone from nearly two pages long hmm. in recent years to, well, less than a paragraph now. Yeah, it's not done, and I'm not particularly happy that they use that word stable to try and get media attention. But it's definitely a lot better. So, um, uh, Alan has a great quote, and I, I don't, I'm going to butcher it, and I, I don't know exactly how it goes. But uh, Alan says that, uh, that, uh, that trusting the butter of S is going to get better one day is like trusting that a serial murder is going to stop killing people one day. And the reason why he says that is uh, when they shipped ZFS, it was that was done. It the format was stable when they shipped it. It was it was baked, and and it has it has and they always have feature flags. It, yes, exactly. It has always been considered stable since then, and then they build on top of it with feature flags. It was from day one they considered it production grade, and the and and that is. And, and honestly, when they said that, I was like, yeah, screw you guys. No file system is production grade until it's been out for a while. And it had it has had some growing pains, but it is now, cons you know, widely considered just sort of like, you know, the master race file system. And so uh, uh, th that is a fundamental approach to ZFS that uh, I guess it just seems like ButterFS is like a top down approach, like create all this great stuff and then make it stable. Whereas ZFS is like make it stable first, then add all the great stuff. I think that's that's a big difference. But Heavens, now I wanted this is probably good. Then this is probably a good time to start talking about XFS and ButterFS. So Heavens, why don't you take it back? Okay. Well, ever since approximately 2008, I have been using XFS on everything that I can use it for. It is all desktop or external drive usages. It is not, let's say, corporate business usage. But don't let that turn you down because NASA and pretty much every large government agency probably uses XFS for their mass storage systems. NASA does, yeah. It is awesome. Oh yeah, because SGI 
the SGI yep. master blades, yep. like super big iron servers. Yep. That's XFS. So it has a long history back from Irix or Irix way back in the friggin' 1980s days. And I have never found a problem with it. They used to say that it used to lose data, but I have never seen that personally. And it is, let's say, an incorrect assumption to n assume that it is based on its past problems. That's basically. There's not really a file system that doesn't have some growing me. pains. All file systems is essentially have no. some issues, like little problems. ZFS has as well. I have been using, I have used XFS yes. uh, since it was, uh, uh, almost since it was originally ported to Linux. And the reason why, and I did this under OpenSUSE, oh, yeah. or actually at the time it was SUSE Enterprise. Uh, the reason why is XFS originally was one of the few file systems under Linux that had extended attribute support. And so because I was integrating it into a Windows domain and the Windows administrators needed to be able to right click on files and change the permissions in the Windows Explorer dialog, you needed to be able to support those NTFS style attributes. Under Linux, they don't have something that's sophisticated, so you have to have something called extended attributes and your file system has to be able to support this. And XFS is now a lot of file systems do, but XFS at the time was one of the few under Linux that did. I think maybe RiserFS was close oh, in yes. there. And so uh, I, I went XFS across a, 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 a set of six file servers for this bank that were under massive heavy load and XFS never once lost a file for us. True. It's, ex it's extended attributes and it's external based and basically that I could change the amount of log buffers that the, like the file system had. I used to tweak the hell out of every file system I could possibly try just because I started on Gen 2 and was having so much fun, uh, yeah. especially the tail, I was, tail packing on Ryzen I did it on 3. Gen 2 as well. Yep, I did it. Gosh, wow, it's bringing back memories. And Wimpy, uh, you had a comment on the old XFS bug, right? Yeah, the, the, it still gets brought up as though it's current. And um, there was a bug in XFS. It was over 10 years ago, and it would truncate files to zero bytes. Yeah, um, 10 years and ago, yeah. So, yeah, it was a long, long time ago. So you still see people referring to that as, oh, it'll eat your data, and it's yeah. just it's just rubbish. Tech Dragon has... Uh, a lot of <clears throat> oh, uh, uh, Tech Dragon, go ahead and uh, slip in the Inconvenient Truth about Butterfest, and I'll bounce it back to heaven. The uh, same company that put so much effort into the start of ZFS is the one currently employing at least one, if not two or three, of the people contributing to ButterFS. <laughs> yes. So it's no. not like they don't know. No, there is. Yeah, there is Oracle people working on ButterFS. Chris left uh, Oracle. He now works at Facebook. Oh, oh that's right. That is true. He that is true. ages ago. Yeah, that is right. That is right. He You're wasn't right. the only one, though. No, but he was the main guy. That is true. Uh, and he works at Facebook. And Facebook, uh, I also got a little bit of scoop on how Facebook uses ButterFS, which totally makes sense. They use it in a totally different way than, than I was using it. Um, so, that, yeah, they, 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 they literally, like, they use it uh, um, in, like, a, in, like, a RAM environment where it's not even, like, it's not even a persistent file system. Like, they wipe it all the time. So I bet it has very few issues because it's constantly getting wiped out. Uh, so yeah. Heaven, Heavens, did you want to pick up from there? Sure. I'll just finish with XFS is not a legacy file system. They do constant refinements, code quality, and like improvements, dead code removal, everything that you would think a modern and well-kept, up-to-date, stable file system should be and have within a modern Linux kernel is. I used to watch its mailing list and watch its git log as they done their commits and watch the evolution of it. It also now has on-disk checksum, so it can detect on-disk errors when they happen. It just can't fix them within the file system because I, they consider that other systems, or at least other subsystems of the storage system, should handle things like, you know, well, Unix philosophy, do one thing and do it well. Right. XFS, store files well. That's what it rocks at. ButterFS, if I should go on to that, sure. its concepts are beautiful. I love it. But B-trees are one of my most favorite data structures that I've ever used. Red, black trees. The thing is, is it, it is a little bit too early for it to be as stable as I need it to be or would want it to be. I consider it 
far more advanced than ZFS could ever be. Mm. As ZFS complain about, oh, they can't defragment, oh, mm -hmm. they can't resilver, mm -hmm. oh, mm -hmm. they can't reallocate files on the disk. You can't remove. Oh, the, they can't deduplicate. You can't remove can't a disk. In, you can't. Well, of course, they've just added the ability to remove a disk well, directly from a pool. I believe that was just added. After all this time, maybe I think all I don't know if it's actually really in production yet. Enterprise usage, right? Right. It is very, very enterprise, enterprise focused. Usage. It's almost. It is almost. It is they exclusive. They do not care at all. Yes, they don't care pretty much at all about desktop or laptop usage. You must have money. You have to throw discs at the problem. That's what ZFS is built around. But ButterFS, they are a lot more desktop focused. It's more practical. It has deduplication. It can do encrypt or encryption. Well, ZFS says, oh no, we can't do that. We have to do, I can't remember that darn feature that as I try to, I loved ZF ZFS too, but it just let me down so much like Ubuntu has in the past. I don't like touching it anymore. <laughs> I just yeah, hope I've never had. I've never, you know, ZFS for me. It's been totally rock solid. I've never had any issues. But I, the problems I have with ZFS are exactly what you're saying. Is anytime I need a storage, anytime I have a solution for ZFS, the answer is throw more disks at it. Even when it's like I have a disk that died and I need to remove it. Okay, cool. Add four more drives, set up another pool, move exactly. stuff around, and then you can extract that one drive once you destroy that pool. I'm like, what? what? No, no, no. I just want to put another terabyte drive in. Yeah, no, probably the better thing to do is buy four more drives. And it's like, what? And it is seriously like, oh, I see. You expect yes. me to have a blank check for storage all the time. That is their assumption, which is unfortunate. So I just hope that they'll come around one day and see the reality that there's more than just the server, that there's probably millions or hundreds of millions of more users of desktop usages than server usages, even though there sure is a lot of, or a large number of server <laughs> installations. So I would say... Uh, I love the snapshots. That's awesome. But they, they had this weird bug that they had this table or they didn't... Their entries within the table in order to do the sub volumes, they limited themselves artificially and they had this ridiculous bug which also was an on disk format change in order to fix that problem it was so weird how they just said oh yeah we'll never have to worry about that and all of a sudden no it blew up their file system they have to completely wipe and re you know copy everything back into the file system to make it usable again of course all of baronix articles or pharaonix articles you can look at so many different problems that butterfest has had in the past but I think it's got promise. It just needs some time. Yeah, maybe so. I think so. it's still too early. Maybe I I, I agree. Early. I think it it's probably awesome. it's probably going to be a down the road thing. My current oh, it's awesome. Yeah, my current solution right now is XFS for like my main rig. So my boot partition is extended four. Uh, I was hard on extended four last week, but in reality, I'm using it in a few places. My boot is ext four. Oh, XFS four is so awesome. XF okay, well, hold on a second. Okay, hold that continue. thought. And then my, my root partition and my home partitions are XFS. And then my editing and gaming mirror that I still haven't set up yet uh, are going to be, I think, extended for again. I might do ButterFS there, but I'm thinking where I'm going to use ButterFS now is in sort of low load where the, the, the file set isn't changing a lot. The size of, of what's in there isn't changing. Where with editing, I'm constantly adding huge files and then deleting them and downloading Steam games and then deleting them. And I don't know if that's a proper use for ButterFS. And I, but but at the same time, uh, there are a couple of games like uh, Bioshock 2 or, yeah, Bioshock Infinite. I guess that's not Bioshock 2. That doesn't work under XFS um, because it uses that uh, EOS wrapper. And so it doesn't make me all that inclined to want to use XFS on that for that for that use for that for that editing gaming mirror. Well, that's an unusual gotcha that you have found. Yeah, yeah, it is, isn't it? But tell me about XFS four. Oh, XFS four is my second favorite file system, or at least mo second most trusted file system. If people are a little bit too hesitant in order to try XFS, just because it seems a little bit too different, X four is beautiful. It is based upon x3 which is thus based upon x2 oh, not it xfs4 years X4. and years of stable oh yes for ext4 oh, oh, ext4 oh. is based oh. on ext3 and oh, ext2 oh. You're talking about extended four oh, it's, okay. they've built upon it yeah. yes extended four they didn't have a log or a, no journal x2 added the journal x3 added extents 
metadata to the file system, X4. That has so much man years behind it and stability behind it is, it is trustworthy in my mind. It's a lot of clustering file systems all have to be or almost require either X4 or XFS. Better FS is just more of a buzzword that a lot of people right. say, oh, yeah, we can use X for better FS. I agree. Go for it. X and for four. It, all right. So I will, I'm going to I'm gonna probably end it here because it's probably people dying about file systems. But Extended 4 is a great file system. I'm using it for my boot oh, yes. file system. However, it's not selling any hardware. XFS, maybe. No, probably not. But ZFS definitely sells hardware. Just ask our friends at IX Systems. ZFS sells machines. And people are switching out, and I, I know this because I'm being told by people that are doing the work, people are switching out their Linux file servers for free BSD machines using ZFS. And they're not opting to run ZFS on Linux. And that's why, that's why I, I actually refuse to run FreeBSD because it doesn't have a correct or a good XFS progress uh, port in the port tree. If, I, if they did have a correct XFS port, that I could use my XFS file system from in FreeBSD, I would probably run FreeBSD. Yeah, it's just well, more people, but, AGI, but for more. for businesses that want ZFS, they're going FreeBSD, and uh, I just that's oh, yeah. that's the only reason. But for for my laptop and my desktop, I'm going to do Extended Four XFS, Extended Four and XFS, and uh, I want to tell you about things I could have done differently now, and a couple of really kind of quick uh, and easy sort of really no duh kind of backup solutions or recovery solutions that you could do if you ever run into a problem like this and things that maybe I could have done if I wasn't sort of already primed to reload, which I sort of was primed to reload. Um, but before we do that, as you know, this show is sponsored by our great friends at DigitalOcean. And wasn't I just mentioning DigitalOcean? DigitalOcean is really a great, it's, it's like my secret. Cause, well, not really, because I tell you guys about it all the time. So if I keep though that, or I'm not very good at secrets, as you might be able to tell. But like, if if uh, I was a contractor, it would. <clears throat> but it kind of because it makes me feel like I'm a boss. It makes me feel like I got a data center. Like I got multiple data centers. Because I'm just like, you know what? I could use a Linux rig today, and I just go spin one up. And that makes me feel like okay, I just got I got infrastructure on demand, like a boss. And that's that's why I say it's my secret. But really, you guys all know about it. In fact, some of you might have known about it before I did. But if you don't know about it, let me tell you, because DigitalOcean is a game changer. And they're really taking Linux and they're taking KVM and they're utilizing open source and they're really making a super compelling product. They're a simple cloud hosting provider dedicated to offering the most intuitive and easy way for you to spin up your own cloud server. You're gonna get root access to this bad mama jamma. They got an HTML5 console for this business, so that way you can get up in there with your web standards. You're not gonna have to complain about Flash or Java. Java, and you can get started in less than 55 seconds. And pricing plans start at only $5 a month. That's less than your crappy burger or your pretentious coffee for the entire month to get yourself your own cloud server. And you can get started in less than 55 seconds. You got that to spare. What are you, a boss? Of course you got... I, I could do that right now while I'm doing a show. It's so fast. 55 seconds for $5 a month. 55 seconds. You can, And honestly, some people do it less than that. And that's one of the things I love because I know I'm going to get in there and get it done fast. You're going to get 512 megabytes of RAM, 20 gigabyte SSD, one CPU, and a terabyte of transfer. DigitalOcean has data center locations in New York, San Francisco, Singapore, Amsterdam, and London. And that major center there, the internet center in uh, Germany, well, a little birdie tells me they're going to have a data center there very soon as well. I think, you know what, why not put some files up in there? It's great. It's a great way to distribute files like with SyncThing or BitTorrent Sync all over the world. And one of the great things you'll really enjoy when you're over at DigitalOcean is the interface to manage your droplets. It's top notch. I've been in IT for like a million years, you guys. And I was like one of the first fools messing around with VMware's proprietary horrible GUIs. And man, nothing burned me more than administering all of these Linux-based VMs from a Windows box because the VMware crapware only worked from a Windows rig to manage all of these ESX boxes. And gosh, that drive me crazy. That's where that was sort of my introduction to like large scale virtualization. So when I saw this DigitalOcean interface, I, I wanted to have its baby. I wanted to go get a uterus surgically implanted into my body, and I wanted to be impregnated by DigitalOcean. I was so impressed by this interface. I'm not even joking. It's incredible. You can do snapshots, DNS management, one-click deployments. You can, do, you can move between data centers. You can transfer between customers. You can destroy machines. I mean, like, it's the best interface I have ever seen to do any of this. And all of that functionality can be replicated with their straightforward API, and they just released their brand new API, version 2.0. 
So go over to DigitalOcean. Try out like the one-click install. Go play with like some freaking core OS. It's like the new hotness. Or if you want to be a masochist and cut yourself, go install FreeBSD. I'm not going to judge. Does it sound like I'm judging? Because I'm not. But here's the best part. Use our promo code DO Unplugged. Don't be a jerk. You'll save yourself some money. You're going to get $10 credit and you support this show. DO Unplugged. They apply that to your account too, so there's no credit card required. Now what excuse do you got? You're going to get your own Linux rig powered by Linux, KVM, SSD infrastructures, tier one bandwidth, any data center you want because they got lots of them. You can do one-click deployments to some of the most badass open source software available in the world. And you get a $10 credit when you use the promo code DO Unplugged. And you're supporting the show. That's a no-brainer. DigitalOcean.com. Go check it out. Use the promo code DO Unplugged. And a really big thank you, DigitalOcean. Damn. For sponsoring the Unplugged program. Okay. So maybe what I should have, could have, would have done, instead of uh, rage quitting my machine and then going on the internet and telling everybody about it. <laughs> uh, <Nah>. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, I got the bell here. I should get rid of this bell because I'm just dinging it all the time. Get get out of here, bell. Order's ready. Fries. I, I threw it out of here. I got out of here. All right. So uh, Cora, uh, Corora, Kiora writes in. Oh, yeah, Kiora. That sounds right. Uh, he writes in with a great tip for easy fallbacks and rollbacks after an update that goes bad using ButterFS and Grub. Uh, it, could all, it could work pretty much on any distro that has that combo. This one is written specifically for Arch, and he's got it in here. And what he's done, Matt, check this bad mama jam out. He has an alias. So he just runs the command sys upgrade. And what that does is that executes a butterfs subvolume snapshot. It snapshots his stuff, date and time stamps the, uh, that snapshot. Then it actually executes the software update. And then after the oh, software update, nice. it appends Grub with the, uh, with the snapshot so that way you could boot into the snapshot if you want to. And Ooh. so with one command, he runs – this is this, this, kind of, this, this is the Linux kind of stuff I love where you get one line and you do all this cool stuff in one line. And so he's aliased all that to just huh. the command sysupgrade. He types sysupgrade and it does all of that. Well, and the fact that he aliased it, that's now, – now you're speaking my language because you're taking easy. Right. <laughs> <I was laughs> like, oh, and he's, like got, he's done the hard work for you. He's got it all laid out uh -huh. here. He's got all his logic here and how wow. you could change it for yourself. This is just a super great – this is one of the greatest con contributions of the week, I think, to the subreddit. Because I'm, I'm going to do this on my rig. Because, you know, essentially – and I'm going to tweak it a little bit because if <laughs> – uh, this is just me. Don't do this. This is something Chris does that you should not do, audience. But see, since I'm doing a snapshot, of course, I've only got ButterFS left on one more rig, but I might as well do it on the rig I've got it left on. Uh, I'm also going to see where I'm going to do Packer instead of uh, Pac-Man, and I'm going to do the uh, dash dash no edit, no confirm, because I just feel like when I just hit, when I, when I, so going back to loving to see the updates, when I do a Packer <laughs> and an SYU and then a no edit and a no confirm, what I'm telling, what I'm saying is, Update all the things. I don't care. Yes to everything. I don't want to change a thing. Take it. And I don't know if it's going to be one package or a hundred packages. And it's so glorious when it's a hundred packages. Oh, let's do it right now. Let's do it right now. I think now. it's a box of Cracker Jacks experience for you. I think you right. like the, the pulling the I do. On it. I do it. Yep. So I'm going to do a Packer dash right. SYU. See, no dash dash, no edit, no confirm. We'll do it right now because it just feels, oh, I got to put my password in there. Don't yeah, look, that, guys. That I'm all right, yeah. so let's see. I'm, I'm synchronizing right now. This is on the Bonobo. We're doing it. Oh, there's some good packages. Yeah, look at all those. Look at all those packages. 60. <laughs> We're going to update. Let's see. We get a new Dropbox up in here. We're, oh, GNOME 3.16.1. So I'm getting an update to GNOME 3.16. I'm getting a new Light DM, new YouTube DL, new Xorg. Oh, this is a pretty solid update for me, Matt. See, this is great. And I'm saying no edit. I'm just taking it. I'm just taking it. And so now what I could do in the future is I could alias that to also do a snapshot. <laughs> See, I'll, instead of doing that, I could do like a, let's just take it all. I'll make the command take it all. And that'll do a snapshot <laughs> and it'll do a packer with the no edit, the no confirm. Because why not do it while I'm doing a show live on the air? Right? Well, I mean, why not? It seems like a perfect wow. time to update my rolling desktop. Light DM, huh? Boy, if I, you know, I will say that one out of every seven times that I update that, it breaks. I'm no, not worried not just, at all. I'm not worried not? at all. Okay. Not okay. one little bit. Everything else I'm okay with, but yeah, that, that's one area where it's like I can consistently point to example after example that there I've had go. issues. Okay, okay, it's done. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> kind of anticlimactic. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. Okay. Uh, so that was okay. one thing I could have done differently is I could have had a sweet 
Um, really no brainer snapshot. Totally should have been doing that since I had ButterFS anyways. And you can see you can all do it in one command line. And uh, we'll have a link to that in the show notes if you would like to try that on your rig. Kind of fun just to play with it anyways. Mm. And mm. maybe not bad for your servers too. Right. And I, you know, we are, uh, our Arch servers here at the studio are running ButterFS. And yes, I said Arch servers. Yes. We run those. Jason wrote in with another suggestion, and this one's a no-brainer, too. He says, uh, you know, if Alan Jude was in the mumble room, I'm sure he would have pointed out that PCBSD has a great backup solution. Now, I thought this was great. I got this mentioned a few times, and I think what this fundamentally demonstrates as PCBSD is taking technologies that are just built into the file system that they're using, and they're wrapping it into a really user-presentable package. Here you go. He says it has a great backup solution. It's called Life Preserver. And we've actually talked about it before on this show and on BSD Now. Uh, but it uses ZFS to create snapshots that can be replicated off to a free NAS server. So you see what they're doing here, right? This is beautiful. So IX Systems is the umbrella in which PCBSD and free NAS and honestly a shit ton of ZFS development are done underneath, right? So they, ca- they are just now just connecting the dots. So if you have a PCBSD workstation and a free NAS file server, you can use Life Preserver to take ZFS snapshots and they just replicate in the background off to your free NAS server. Now here is the final punch. When your machine dies, you pop back in a PCBSD install CD and you choose the option to rescue and restore using Life Preserver backups. And then it just goes and fetches them from the free NAS box and writes it back down to the rig. Wow. Now, there's no, I like that. There's no reason OpenSUSE couldn't do that or right. Ubuntu couldn't do that with ButterFS, right? True. And it's it's just interesting, like it's just that God, small. Like, great. remember last week? <clears throat> mm. I think it was last week. I think I was going on about how the reason why Docker's had so much success is because they closed that ten percent gap. They made some existing technology usable by more people, by developers, by by uh, by you know companies and by organizations. Like they closed that ten percent gap. That's what PCBSD is doing here too. They're closing that gap. They're connecting those final dots. It's all stuff you could roll your own solution. I could do ButterFS snapshots that that maybe write to a mounted NFS uh, partition on my free NAS server. I could do that. But this does it for me, and they can integrate that with the with the with the update system. It's integrated with the file manager, so you can be in the directory and you can reverse in that directory right there, which is way more palatable to end users. It's way more sensical, and it's it's an so, example of just a gap that in Linux we just don't sometimes close. Interesting. So I'm pretty sure uh, in a you say Ubuntu could do this. We did. Uh, I th- yeah. I'm pretty sure if you run your system partition on ButterFS and you do an app get disk upgrade, there's a snapshot option that well, will snapshot good. your system before. I so like that. We and there's do have it. It's just Yum does it too. It. Yum does it too. But I, I'm, what I'm talking about is like this full connecting of like, here's the GUI, it's integrated with the file manager, and it writes to the file server. That's a pretty sweet combo, right? right? Yeah. Um, yeah. That's one of the things that impressed me about Fedora is they also jumped on that. And it, it works really well. You can have Yum do snapshots and all that. And and um, I really should have been doing that. I just, for me, I just a reload isn't the end of the day other than just the productivity. I think maybe because it's so straightforward to snapshot, it's probably worth it. it I think so. Yeah. yeah. But it is interesting to see how the other side does it over, over on PCBSD. Makes me a little jelly. I would love some, like, you really user-friendly distro to kind of s- just solve that. Or, or maybe, like, even kind of rip off Apple a little bit and use ButterFS snapshots but say, hey, I've detected you've detached or you have, you have plugged in a 20 gigabyte or larger external storage. Would you like to start saving snapshots to this? Sort of like Time Machine does? Or detect it on the network. I mean, no, that'd be That cool. would be nice, too. Like, there's a file share on I the network. I prefer that, actually. You know? Yeah, I really would, too, prefer to back up over the network. Just because, well. I mean, the whole buy USB thing, it's like, that's adorable. How last year of you. you and know, and end just, users yeah. are always going to mess that up. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I, I guess I lesson learned a little bit, but I thought, yeah. I still think I'm going to, I'm going to, for now, I'm going to hold the position that um, moderate, I, I think I think unless you're unless you're really comfortable with uh, you know quick recovery solutions, I, I just don't know if I can recommend ButterFS to people. And I, I think I'm going to hold that line. A lot of people wanted me to retract that, and I think not that I just not that I want to argue, but I I think for right now maybe it's best to to stick with extended for or XFS and well, I, yeah. leave ButterFS to those of you who maybe have secondary machines, you know, and things like that. 
Well, here's why I can actually agree with that sentiment and, and point it out in a very – just point it out to where this really takes away the debate. When you break a file system, chances are your data is probably okay. However, when you – know, or when you break your installation and your data is okay. Now, with a file system that's containing, say, oh, I don't know, your data, um, and, and that breaks you know, because of a kernel update or whatever the issue may be, that's not really something you just take some time out of your data to recover from. Because potentially that could also be your backup. I mean, you know, it, it, how far does it go? You know, how far do you actually put into trusting that particular uh, file system? You know, and again, I'm just speaking as someone looking through the peephole here. That my impression of it, and why I've never bothered with this, because I never really had clear answers on how much trust do I want to put in a file system that I really don't have a lot of faith in. Really, I don't Kirby, know. It's just me. I'll give you the final word. Um, I'm yeah. surprised to see you agree. I, I picked on your post quite a bit. You seem to be a pretty big ButterFS advocate. You said it is the future. I still believe it is the future, but mm. I would agree that I wouldn't recommend it to other users. I've been done quite. I'm a, not that big a Linux switcher, but I've done quite a few Linux installs for other people. And I haven't been using ButterFS, but to play with it, anyone who enjoys Linux, I would definitely recommend having a play with it. Whether you trust your data to it, that's mm -hmm. up to you. Hmm. Right. Yeah, well okay. said. I think that summarizes it perfectly. And I'm going to end on this. Uh, for, for people, what I'm going to continue to recommend is EXT4 and a good backup. Uh, just get ex extended yeah. four. Uh, I, I don't think well, extended, I do. extended four isn't going to blow my skirt up. That's fine. Extend, extended four isn't going to sell <laughs> file servers off racks. Extended sure. four isn't going to stop the bleed to free BSD. That's all fine. Maybe Butterfest can take another five years and lose less files, and then we'll finally by then have a uh, have an answer to a file system that's been in production in the market for five years. And if that's the loss we have to take because we didn't have the right solution at the right time, not the end of the world for Linux. It's not going to yeah. kill Linux. I think you need your bell back. Because <laughs> <laughs> that needed, I don't know, I kind of needed a name. I, that was, I did kind of try to wrap it up positively and then swipey, managed to put a little, little, little bit of dagger in there again. I, there were some claws. I didn't really I, need I felt to. a scratch. I felt some scratch. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. A little, a little damaged. I, don't know. I just I take it so seriously <laughs> for some reason. I don't know why. You know, Matt, or, I, I just... I used to be responsible for file servers. And so this is an important thing to me because I was sort of the guardian of data. And so I take it very seriously. It's, it's, it's a call that I must answer. In the meantime, I'm going to be so obsessed with Linux Fest Northwest that I'm not really going to care that much. <laughs> Matt, uh, where should people find you throughout the uh, Right now, with everything that's going on, best thing to do is go to matthartley.com and make sure you're subscribing to either the Google Plus or the Twitter, or preferably, if you want the best solution of all, get on the email list. I don't want spam oh, you. Oh, nice. Just going to get you some updates. I like you know, that. What's going on? It's like the personal line to Matt. Now, sure. well, well, hold, on, hold on. Now, hold on. Now, what about uh, the, what if you happen to make some sort of random appearance on, say, Linux Gamecast? Would I find that at mattheartley.com? You would. Okay. Um, any Very type nice. of uh, appearance I'm going to have, you're going to actually know about it because Smooth, you're at mattheartley.com. You're That's subscribed. Smooth. You know what's going on. That's smooth. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for tuning this week's episode of Linux Unplugged. Be sure to join us next week. We do this show on Tuesdays. Go to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar to get this in your local time zone. Don't forget about our meetup group, meetup.com slash jupiterbroadcasting. Last but not least, make this show even better. Show up live. Join our virtual lug. You can get the mumble address in our chat room or go to linuxactionshow.reddit.com. See you next week, everybody. I got I got randomly accused by Wimpy for being drunk, and I I, I don't I get this accusation from time to time, and unfortunately <laughs> I wish it was true. The studio has been dry for I think more than three months. Right. There has not been uh, any liquor in here, unfortunately. Oh wow, really? It's true. You plant a uterus in me and Chris, I think I will fix me. that when I'm out there. <laughs> I know. We're definitely gonna fix the, the state of liquor. I will be drunk. <laughs> For probably a few weeks of shows after Linux Fest Northwest, as I, I mean, I refuse to throw booze out, so I have to consume it all. But yeah, <laughs> I, I was on fire a little bit. You know what? It's true though. I would have DigitalOcean's man child, so um, I'll admit it. I'm just, uh, I'm just letting you know, I'm being honest with who I am. I would, I would have their, their love child. I would go have dirty, dirty love, and ha I probably shouldn't say this, but I would do it. Did you know <laughs> coconut oil is a good hangover cure? <laughs> <laughs> JBTitles.com. Oh and uh, so when I was shopping today, <clears throat> I, I noticed that now Costco in, in very large bulk is uh, selling uh, coconut oil. 
and huge really? things of coconut oil. Now, oh. let, let me tell you, if you're looking for a good, solid, healthy thing to fry your foods in, uh, yeah. coconut oil, my friends, coconut oil also works as a lubricant. This is true. It's, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's totally natural and healthy to use as a lubricant. That's right. So you can cook with it, and you can, f- you, can you know... I wonder if it would work on my truck door, which is kind of squeaky. You could. Yeah, it could be like a poor man's uh, WD-40. Squeaky, 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 squeaky. Have you seen that video about coconut oil, how it does, it, it solves everything? No. Is there a video out there? Right, hold yeah, on. It's, a, it's, just like a, it's like a parody video about it. Is it long? Everything. I wouldn't mind seeing no, that. No, it's like, Cause I have it's to like tweet. two or three minutes. All right. Well, I could play that while I tweet out that we're live and stuff. Do you remember what it's called? Uh, no, but I can look it at my history. Oh, jeez. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, sure. <laughs> oh, not that. Oh, gosh, sure not to, that. Uh, oh, you gosh. You want to see my history. Oh, not that. Oh, boy. Uh, all right. So here it is. I'll let. Uh, Your skin is looking great. I'm going to play this while I uh, tweet out and stuff. So I'll be uh, BRB while that. I'll be bathing in oil. <laughs> Gross. 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 <laughs> <laughs> You know what? Your skin is looking great. Oh my god, thank you. Mm-hmm. I'm using coconut oil. <gasps> that stuff is amazing. Oh, I know. I love it. I take my makeup off with it. I wash my face with it. I moisturize with it. I cook with it mm-hmm. all the time. Mm-hmm. Did you know you can brush your teeth with that? Yeah. No, no, no. No, I knew that. You can also use it on your hair. And did you know that it's a natural deodorant? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's great for your metabolism. It's great for your circulation. Mm-hmm. <laughs> also, really good for wounds. Any mm-hmm. kind of wound. You know you can run your car on it. I mean, the government doesn't want you to know that, but you can run your car on it. Did you know that one time I found a dead bird in my garden, and I brought it inside, and I dipped it in coconut oil, and then it came back to life? <laughs> real yeah i mean it is amazing stuff (laughs) hey you know that deep pit of anxiety that you carry with you every day but you don't really notice it until it's all consuming and completely ruining your life totally wouldn't it be great if you could put coconut oil on that (laughs) totally yes totally totally, yes (laughs) god Uh. fix me already Oh All right, that was great. That was yeah, way that better was than awesome. I was expecting. That was actually quite good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, God, that makes me already. Of course, I didn't. I was too busy watching. I didn't really tweet, but that's okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, although uh, coconut oil is awesome, so uh, eat it. Oh, it truly is. And, you know, I put it on my wounds and whatnot. And, well, uh, I, did. And just, I bring things back to life. And all sorts I wouldn't of stuff. say that, but uh, <laughs> I do put it in my coffee sometimes. What? I do put it in coffee sometimes. And it's great to cook with. It really is one of the best oils to uh, to fry with because it has such oh, a yeah. high burning point. So uh, it's Excellent. a great cooking oil, uh, and uh, it makes uh, yeah yeah. It's it's just it's really good for you. In fact, uh, it is good. Like if you just eat even a it sounds weird, but even even eat a spoonful of it is actually good for you. Oh man, I'm doing my Linux unplug stretches. Oh, I've been doing a lot of I've been doing a lot of driving around today because uh, today's Dylan's birthday, my son Dylan. And uh, so, you know, I had to go get him a cake, and then this, this is how it goes. So I have to go get my son Dylan a cake, and Costco makes some pretty good cakes. And so I decided I had to go get him a Costco cake because they have a chocolate cake with chocolate filling that he likes and chocolate frosting. So I go over there, and I get this Costco cake. It says, happy birthday. It's, it's great. It's perfect. In fact, I think I even have a picture of it. Hold on. I'll, I'll pull up a picture. And, you know, I, I, gotta, I, should probably, I should probably give you a little background here. I'm not big on doing sort of um, vaguely defined errands. Uh, before I go on air, uh, because it's just you know I it, I just so many times have had a situation where I just didn't expect something to come up, and so then I'm like I'm I'm rushed to get on air. So I, I decide, but you know what? It's his birthday. Today's a special day. I'm gonna go to Costco and I'm gonna get him his birthday cake. So I go pick up a birthday cake, and it looks good. These birthday cakes are freaking huge. It says like it's two pounds or whatever. No, it's like it's like 25 pounds. Seriously, you, you can barely carry it with one hand. I'm not even kidding. And so then I can barely fit it in my truck. My truck, like, like it does too big to fit in a seat, and it's too big to fit on the floor. So, like, it's precarious to transport. And so, I get it home. And I, I mean, I get it to the studio, and surprise, surprise, it doesn't fit in the studio fridge. Well, okay, now we got a little bit of time crunch because I have a lunch meeting, and I've got to get this cake delivered back to my house and in the fridge, which means I got to clear out space in the fridge because this thing's a monster. This is like literally trying to fit Godzilla in your fridge. It's the Godzilla cake. And so I'm like, okay, I got to make sure. I get home, I get a spot cleared out, I get this in the fridge, I get back in the truck, I get to my lunch meeting, and then I get back in time to do Linux Unplugged. Like, this is all running through my head. Major pressure to get this cake. I get to the studio. 
first. I'm like, if I can just bypass getting to the house, I can save myself about 20 to 40 minutes. So I say, self, here's what you're going to do. Let's take this back to the studio, skip running home. That's just a waste of gas anyways. And you can just remember, you can remember to bring this home at the end of the day. You can do this. And I think to myself, you know what? For Dylan's birthday, I won't ever forget this cake. I will remember. So I, so I say compromise. All right, self, we'll take it to the studio. So I get in the truck. Somehow I precariously drive this thing back to the studio, which is only about 10 minutes away from Costco. So it's a nice quick run. I get back to the studio. I clear out a whole shelf, which to be honest, It's not easy in the studio, mostly my fault. I got a lot of meat parts up in this business. And so I I clear all the meat parts out of the way, throw away some of the nasty meat parts. In fact, I threw away about a shelf's worth of stuff, and I try to fit the cake in the fridge. Well, guess what? Cake doesn't fit in the fridge. Too big, of course. And and you know what? Nothing makes you feel more like a middle-class pedestrian than when you've just bought a cake that's too big for your own fridge. (laughs) Like... I was just like, God, am I that cheap? Did I, what, did I like cheap out when I bought this fridge? Like, I, I seem to remember this being an expensive fridge, and yet I can't even fit a birthday cake in it. Like, and then I start thinking, like, this is a problem rich people never have. I don't, know, I don't know why my mind goes there, but I start hating my entire life because I cannot fit this cake in the fridge. Like, this obviously is a judgment on my failure to properly provide myself a fridge large enough to fit this cake, and now I got to drive this cake back to my house, and it's time to start the show. And I was getting very upset. I'm sorry. So anyways, I rushed the cake home. I made it to my meeting. Cake's in the fridge. Everything's fine. But, but I then had an overflowing garbage back at the studio. Disgustingly full of meat bits and like a big bottle of spicy V8, which nobody likes spicy V8. If you like spicy V8, I'm sorry, but come on. Doesn't that give you farts? Right? So. Um. So you, get, so, so you go with the regular V8, right? So I go with the regular V8 normally. So there's this half-drinking thing of spicy V8 because I hate to throw it away, even though I don't want to get farts. But So I drink, I halfway drink this thing, but you know what? It gives me farts, so I decide, you know, I'm not going to finish drinking this V8. So I put it in the fridge. It sits there for like three weeks because I'm trying to bring myself to the point to throw away half a thing of a gallon of V8. Finally today, I'm at that point because I was trying to make room for the cake. You know what? Cake takes priority. That justifies throwing away the V8. Boom, decision made. So I get back to the studio. Garbage is full of crap. V8 sitting on top of it. I'm like, you know what? I got to take this garbage up before I do a show. It's going to stink this place up. So I go to lift the garbage up out of the garbage can. And of course, all the the handles just rip off because it's like stuffed full of food. And it's been in there for like probably two days longer than it should. So I'm like, oh, God. So then I try to pull the bag out. And of course, I go to pull the bag out. And of course, the bag just rips. So I'm like, all right, fine. You know what? You just go do this the hard way. And I just pick up the entire garbage can because you know what? Why not? So I pick up the whole garbage can. I, I, I gracefully, thanks to years of IT of carrying computers and monitors and still having to carefully open up doors, I gracefully managed to carry the garbage can and open the door. No problem there at all. I walk around the bush. I walk around my truck. I sidestep around a cat that happens to walk by. And I go to open up the garbage can. And as I open up the garbage can, of course the thing of V8 falls off the top of the garbage can. And when it hits the ground, it just explodes everywhere. V8 all over my freaking legs. V8 all over the garage. V8 all over the truck. I am covered in V8 right now. And I'm ready to do a show. That's been my morning. There you go. <laughs> wow. That seems like quite a journey. And that's why doing something as simple as getting a cake is never that simple for me. And that, you know what? I just don't need that. I just don't need that kind of thing. And you know what? My son will never know. He'll never know. Unless he comes back and listens to old uh, pre shows. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Anthony and Sin, the IRC, said that you should just eat some of it until it fits. <laughs> <laughs> the logical solution. Yeah, I just should have thought of that. If it was pie, I might have been tempted. A chocolate cake. You know, this is the other thing. I'm just not like. I'm not excited about this cake at all. It's all chocolate. And and, yeah, not, I, and I all chocolate cake. Chocolate, you know what? Chocolate is delicious. I just, it's mono. It's like one note. Eh, all right. How about we hit a few notes? Let's combine a few ingredients. That's like, you know, then, then it's like those ingredients are making love in my mouth. And it really tastes good. But if you just go all chocolate, eh, okay, all right. So, uh, Chris, you know how you make that better? No. Vanilla ice cream. Yeah, that's, that is the truth. Yeah, I a raspberry that. layer would be awesome as well. Yes, exactly. See, that's all I'm saying is just put a little spice in there. Put a little berry. Put a little white cream in there, you know? 
Go a little white. If you're going all chocolate, if you're going chocolate frosting, chocolate cake, go a little white buttercream in the middle. That's amazing, right? That's amazing. You just go chocolate in the middle. I'm like, okay, more chocolate. Well, good thing I like chocolate, but I've already had a lot of chocolate. And then it's like I have this huge plate of chocolate, which is fine, but I get the idea after about three solid bites. Fourth bite, I'm feeling like, yeah, I love chocolate. Fifth bite, I'm like, okay, I got it. It's chocolate. Six bites, I'm totes done, right? But you add up some variety to that. I'm like, ooh, it tastes a little bit different each bite. Sometimes I get a little more of this and I get a little bit of less of this, and I like that. Like every single freaking bite can be its own custom experience. And all you have to do to have a custom experience with every single bite of cake is just have a little variation. Add a tiny bit of variation. It's not that big of a deal, but yet every Everybody's like, oh, I love chocolate cake. Chocolate cake's great. Yeah, it's great, but it can be way better. It can be like, it, it's like, uh, never mind. I just, so yeah, it's chocolate cake. I did all this work for a chocolate cake that I'm not even really going to enjoy eating. I'm going to have like three bites of it. Happy this birthday.